Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I am your host, Stephen Heinecker. And just a reminder, this month's book giveaway is Battlefields, Temple Grounds, Latter-day Saints in Guam and Micronesia, edited by my good friend, Devin Jensen. Um, email me. It's going to be in the description. Make sure in the subject heading, you put in book contest and leave me your name and address. It ends the um, April 30th, last day for the deadline, and U.S. residents only. I'm very excited to have this guest on today. We've been in communication with each other for a while. And I, I remember reaching out to him because, of course, he's kind of been publicly telling his story about his faith journey on Facebook and, and talking about it. And it's just a very interesting story. Uh, Daniel Ortner was actually raised, uh, you were actually born in Israel yep. and you were raised Jewish. Mm -hmm. And you converted and later in life would convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And also, but there's a twist. There's actually the journey continues. And we're going to talk about that continuing journey. But before we do that, Daniel, welcome to the show today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. So Daniel is actually uh, went to BYU Law School. He's a constitutional law attorney. He specializes in the First Amendment. So really cool. Always about the First Amendment people. Love you all. Uh, <laughs> keep, keep up the good work there, Daniel. And uh, we want to thank you for your service for defending the First Amendment. Uh, that's very important because it's at definitely uh, it's not it's not doing very well right now. It's under attack. Yeah, I think we so... need everyone to fight fight and stand up for it. You know, for for everyone ultimately. Absolutely, for all the voices. Like I always say, all the voices of restoration will be heard. I'm more book reviews. I think it's important that all the voices are heard in the public square, as well. So, Daniel, uh, let's just start talking a little bit about yourself. I'd like a little biographical information. I mean, here you are. You are born in. Israel, you're raised yeah. Jewish and you end up going to Miami, Fort Lauderdale. I mean, that's like, you know, behind New York, probably one of the most Jewish uh, areas in the United States. Um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I was born in Israel. Uh, my, my my parents lived in the United States. My, my, my mom spent most of her life in New York, but they moved to Israel when I was born. My family is mostly there. My sisters and other relatives are mostly in Israel. So they moved there to be close to family, um, moved to the United States when I was about three and a half, so pretty young, but we'd go back every, every summer, you know, still visit very often, go, you know, be in Israel uh, most summers and other times to visit family. And so I spent a lot of time there growing up. Um, my dad was a, a atheist agnostic Jew, which is quite common, you know, in, in Judaism, but he, you know, his, most of my, his, his, a lot of his ancestors died in the Holocaust. Um, you know, his, his grandparents, his parents were survivors, but they're, siblings died, the relatives, aunts, uncles, and most of their relatives died in the Holocaust. A big portion of their family died. They're from Poland um, in a town near near, Aus near, near Auschwitz. Uh, okay, so, so I actually have a quick question for you, because it is true, a large portion of Jews in today's modern world are atheist agnostic. Yeah. Since you brought up the Holocaust, do you think that a large portion of people becoming atheists within the Jewish community was a result of the Holocaust? Do you think that was I, kind I think of so. Shifted? I think a lot, of, a lot of, at least my my dad, that was his reason. He couldn't see how you know, loving God could permit that. And I think that it's, it's, a, it's a common sentiment I've heard in the Jewish community that it, you know, it's, it's kind of shows that God was not there. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it affected Jewish uh, theology and everything. It fundamentally changed the direction of Judaism in, 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 a, in, a, in, I mean, I mean, it's just a stunning, but yeah, to almost see the decimation of your people. I think like the that. kind of result was a lot of you know, political kind of Zionism, you know, we're going to yeah. do it, take, take action ourselves, kind of not wait on God, but be yeah. politically active and, and push to have a state and, uh, and, and uh, defend ourselves. And that, that's really a result of the Holocaust. I think that kind of drive for self-determination, like really strong, you know, we're, we're not going to get pushed around again. So I think that. I think that yeah. Kind of yeah. And then Zionism was pr pr primarily a secular endeavor, um, you know, it was kind of became the secular religion of, of uh, within Judaism in one sense. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's astonishing to think about the story. So now I'm assuming because you were born in Israel, you also are a dual citizen. You're both a citizen yeah. of the United States mm -hmm. and Israel. Yeah, I was born a born a dual citizen, or you know, got got dual citizenship right after I was born. So okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I'll sorry. continue. I'll say my 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 mom was religious, uh, like very spiritual person, very much believing in God, but was um, not not observant. We didn't uh, keep the Sabbath strictly in our house or keep kosher in our house. We'd always, you know, we'd eat pork and shellfish. Our favorite like food was lo you know, lobster. Like we, we, we would, we did not keep uh, the, the rules very strictly, but we were, you know, very Judaism was a big part of my identity. I went to a Jewish private school for elementary school. I um, would keep, we'd keep the holidays um, in our house. Um, you know, Seder or 
uh, Hanukkah, menorah, you know, kind of all, all the cultural and ho holiday traditions. And when we did go to synagogue, we'd go to uh, Chabad synagogue, which is a very conservative, uh, very religious uh, institution, but they liked it. It felt very welcoming to them. And they liked the traditional kind of melodies and, and uh, traditional services when we did go to services. So this would be more like ortho a type of Orthodox Judaism, would you say? Chabad is a, they're kind of a offshoot of Orthodoxy. They're, they're very um, missionary zeal focused in terms of to, to Jewish people. So they're the ones who are trying to go out, out there, even on street corners in New York City, you'll see them on the Met in the subway sometimes asking people to put on Jewish people to put on tefillin, like the, the phylactery, phylacteries on their hands and their head, because they believe that you know, they want to reach all the Jews that they can as kind of their mission. So they, they have a very outward uh, missionary focused zeal to them. To bring secular Jews back into more, you know, yeah, Jewish they're a fascinating organization. They have, they have an interesting history and uh, you know, very, very interesting group. But, but yeah, okay, like, well, that's fascinating like because welcoming and upbeat. That was kind of what drew them, and it was less, less of the theology. It was more they had their kind of services were high energy, a lot of singing and excitement, and they they were very welcoming. So we like they like my parents like their services. Oh, interesting, and of course that's fascinating because evangelism, evangelism and Judaism is not something that goes hand in hand. So yeah. you're kind of prepped in some sense for mission work <laughs> because of a church that was or a, a synagogue that was practicing uh, mission work. That's very fascinating. Uh, to no, think. No, no, I wasn't very, it wasn't involved with that as a growing up, but we were kind of on the outskirts of it, so right. it wasn't really uh, something we got involved with. But it's, got it, yeah. got it. So you're raised in a relatively uh, your your judaism that you're raised with is relatively conservative but you guys really aren't practicing it it's just kind of something you would like a, like a some like, like a catholic who just goes to church on christmas and easter kind of a similar yeah. thing like I think that it was probably a little more than that in that it was a big part of our of identity for uh -huh. our family you know it, it was really my, my dad even even though he was an atheist or agnostic really identified with judaism the history of it um the, the kind of stories of the bible of of King David of the the Jewish people were were a big thing you know in my family so it was it was more than just on the holidays it, it was a, it was a big part of our my my understanding of my identity growing up and so growing up of course you would have then had a bar mitzvah is that correct yes yeah so you 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 definitely were practicing in many ways so that's that's really fascinating so maybe just talk a little bit about yourself so growing up Jewish you had an atheist father but you guys attended services what did you think of God? What did you What did you believe growing up in the Jewish? Yeah, I mean, when I was house? like really little, I kind of didn't think much of God at all. My my mom would say, you know, God doesn't have a a computer, an IBM computer. Is like kind of her saying like he's not tracking what you're doing. She didn't see him as like really caring whether you did or didn't observe traditions. She thought he just cared if you were a good person, and that's kind of what I grew up thinking. Uh, but I also had a lot of questions about the the purpose of life. Um, my dad uh, was had bad, poor health for growing up. He had um a lot of heart problems. He had his a third um, open heart surgery when I was 11 or 12, uh, when I was you know pretty young and he would in and out of hospitals. Um, and so the kind of the, the, the mortality, you know, death, like what happens after we die, these kind of questions were really heavy for me. Uh, and something I thought about even from, you know, the age of like five or six, I went, I went to the library and asked what books they had about death. You know, I was kind of really thinking a lot about the purpose of life and that weighed really heavily on me and and so i i really explored that and thought a lot about it uh, growing up and then um i went uh elementary school i went to a jewish private school then i switched to a, a public school and i began to have christian friends uh -huh. for the first time and learned you know they introduced me to some of their ideas um, about jesus and I, I began exploring that and just really looking for answers to questions about what what is the purpose of life what why are we here what happens after we die i, I really thought a lot about those things for, you know, for my age, I think. And so you said you interacted with Christian friends in a public school setting. So maybe just talk a little bit about those interactions uh, as a, a Jewish boy interacting with Christians and they're talking about Jesus. I mean, yeah. tell me how those conversations went and did you make friends with, did you have Christian friends? Yeah, some were really good. I had a, a, a good friend who um, she, we, we, we dated, I think back in eighth, 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 eighth grade or ninth grade. And she was a really good friend of mine. And she introduced me to G like to Christianity and to Jesus in ways that really impacted me pretty heavily. Um, on the other hand, there were people like the, there was a Bible in my high school. There was like a Bible group, uh, you know, by, by, you know, a student club, and they kind of engaged in some pretty I don't not great behaviors. Like they um, would invited me to somewhere kind of do a, a surprise Bible like like you know, try to save me type thing, and then they they kind of try to invade the Jewish uh, student club at one point and kind of take it over, like some not great, not great behaviors in some ways. And, you know, that, that was not, 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 a, not 
ideal at all. I think that kind of turned me off from from what they were were sharing ultimately. And so then you kind of saw some some good things and some some bad bad behaviors there as well. I think was this high school? Where was this high school located? South, South Florida in the Fort Lauderdale area. Okay, so would you have had any interactions with like Dr. Uh, J- D. James Kennedy, uh, Presbyterian Church? Would because a lot of that that's that's a pretty big evangelical church out that way. Uh, do you know the kids were affiliated with that church? Or no, or I don't think so. Um, the one of the girls who was in the head of in my class, she was she like she ended up being valedictorian in my class. She, her dad was a was a local pastor, a local pastor or bishop, and so he he was uh or, 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 or yeah, so he was pretty involved. Uh, or she she was pretty involved with this group, and then others I think mostly were non denominational. Most of the people I I, I knew like uh, older kind of talking about faith, you know, knowing the details were were non denominational. Hmm. Had some Catholic friends as well. Okay, so so basically, your your interactions with Christianity wasn't that positive because of some of the actions that these evangelicals were doing and trying to proselytize you. Course, and yeah, and then, and then I think my my friend who I was really close to, um, she introduced me to um, Isaiah uh, chapter fifty three of Isaiah, and that was just a real amazing, real turning point for me. Reading that for the first time, uh, seeing the this prophecy of the suffering servant, and it it seemed so clear to me that was about Jesus it just really hit me so strongly and stood stuck with me ever since you know my, my kind of life's gone on a lot of up and down journeys and in, in faith and and that feeling of reading that and seeing Jesus and it really changed my life in so many ways and and so you know I could I could really feel that the truth of that the 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 power of those words and this prophecy and then um you know it, it really made me want to learn more about Jesus and um seek him out ultimately so isaiah 53 really did affect you so even though maybe you were turned off by some things you that they really stuck with you that the, yeah. that whole that whole chapter that's fascinating yeah. to me there were a couple of, it was a, you know a couple of year period there in high, in high school where i was really looking into christianity and uh like really believe started believing in it and then my parents when i told them about it reacted very negatively to it and so i eventually backed off from it um my mom got sick uh, when i was uh, in high school with cancer and she died when I turned 18, like at the end of high school. And so from her reaction, it was, you know, the, the worst thing possible for me to do. And so I kind of backed away from it at the time, but I kind of stuck with me, even though I never kind of fully mm-hmm. committed myself to Jesus. I was kind of on, on the margins about uh, whether I believed in him or not. And then I backed away, got more involved with Judaism for a while. And then I eventually became an atheist when my mom died. Uh, oh, okay. Shadow I can see that. So, I can see yeah, that. So you're 18 yeah. years old. You and, and is your father still alive or he's no, he he's, died uh eight years ago. Okay. So your father oh, well, so it looked like for most of you growing up that your father would be the one that would pass. And then your it ended up being your mother that passed. Yeah, and it yeah, been a real shock and passed away after two two and a half years with wrestling with uh, fighting cancer. And uh-huh. so that was really devastating for me as a uh, I was really close to my mom she was an amazing love an amazing mother and and so loving and so supportive and so just incredible you know incredible mother um, and I it was really hard for me to to lose her uh, at that age and hard to see how God would allow that to happen and and it really shattered my faith so your faith is shattered and you become an atheist why don't you describe what that was like because now I was an atheist for like a dozen years yeah. um were you also suffering depression and all these other things? Kind of talk about your mental state and where you yeah. were uh, in that period. No, I, I, I was, I went off to college. I was at Brandeis University in the Boston area. Um, it's a heavily Jewish school, but you know, not very religiously Jewish. It's kind of fifty, you know, majority Jewish, but but more secular Jews. Um, so a lot, and, lot, and I was actually very involved with kind of arguing with theists. I would, I would try to prove that God didn't exist. I um was involved with the Brandeis Humanist Society and kind of used to love to go to debates between you know, atheists and, and and religious people and kind of listen to the arguments that they'd make. Um, I got very involved in, I mean, kind of, you know, fo- focused on evolution, focused on natural causes of the universe. Um, I saw religion as kind of archaic and unnecessary and people that were religious as, you know, kind of backwards or superstitious. So I was, I was very, very uh, cynical about religion and um, I call it myself a humanist. So I had a very positive view of humanity, kind of the potential of humanity to rise above or rise rise up from superstition and tradition and kind of perfect itself. So I was I was very optimistic about humanity, but very cynical about you know, anything supernatural. I didn't think. And actually, good. humanism is very much a Christian is a Christ, comes out of Christianity and everything too. So it's kind of a Christian thing too. I, I call, yeah. some, call myself a Christian humanist. I think it's a it's a very noble 
uh, position to take in many ways. I, I didn't realize when I was, you know, obviously growing, growing up, you grow up in a society that the Western world is influenced by Christianity and you know, 2000 years of how Christianity shaped views on human rights, on uh, the rights of man, on on the kind of equal, equality and, 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 you know, inherent worth of people. And you don't realize how much everything we be, you believe is shaped by Christianity or, you know, Juda Judaism and Christianity ultimately. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think people who are humanists are kind of, you know, they, they're kind of building on the foundation of these great Christian developments without realizing it. They're, they're kind of not aware of how, how that's contributing to their beliefs. Uh, they think they're, you know, very enlightened and independent, but Christianity is what formed the world that we live in that, that is, you know, that, that uh, in, it believes in, in freedom and equality and equal dignity and human rights. And the, these things that we cherish, I think, really come from, from Christianity ultimately. Oh, yeah, that's so true. It, it really does affect everything. So here you are, you're a humanist at Brandeis, you're going after the theists, you're, you're, you're battling, you're an atheist. Um, I need to hear more of the story where you ultimately at some point decide to become a Latter-day Saint. I need to hear your, your continuing journey as an atheist. And then how, tell me how you got to the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints in that in that route as well. Yeah, it's um, my best friend in college was a was was an inactive Latter-day Saint. Um, she was raised kind of Jewish mix of Judaism and LDS. Um, so her, her grandmother had converted. So she was, had kind of both, both backgrounds, but at the time she was not really religious at all in, in college, but I, I knew she was uh, kind of a Latter-day Saint Christian background a little bit. I knew that vaguely, but I, I didn't really know much about it. Um, I had some, I, I had experiences kind of that, that humbled me and made me open to want to believe in God again. I kind of saw my own failings, like to live up to my, my values and my own Kind of potential and i really just felt a, a, a kind of void in my soul for for god again after a couple of years of being pretty ardently atheist and i, I just kind of felt this lack um somewhere in you know, uh, in me that that i began to kind of explore i, I spent a summer in china when i was an undergrad and i i had a, a teacher who was a, a instructor who was a member of the local christian community and we had like hours long debates about god and the world and morality and philosophy and and uh and and in that process of that summer, I kind of really opened myself up to wanting to believe in God again and began thinking about, you know, if I looking for faith and um, seeking a little bit again. And so that, and then at the right around the time that after that summer, my, my friend became active um, LDS again. And I, I began to look into her, into the, into the church. Uh, I went to a bookstore and kind of began reading about the kind of Mormonism for dummies uh, type books uh, and, really was connected with some of the doctrines that I read about, especially they, they seem very, you know, now looking back at it, I think they're very humanist in some ways. The, the idea of, you know, we, we were here, we, we kind of, before this life, we existed, we're, we're eternal beings. Uh, we have the potential, you know, infinite potential to become God. Um, and those ideas really resonated with me and the kind of idea of the spirit world and the chance to hear about the the, the gospel after this life just really resonated with me. And made me want to explore more. And so I began looking into the LDS church and had a powerful conversion experience outside of the temple in Boston, uh, where I just really felt God, God's presence and speaking to me and knew he was there and knew that he loved me and, and, and was my, my father and cared about me. And that you know, stuck with me ever since that, that real powerful feeling of God, God's love and his presence. And so that, you know, after that, I of course, interpreted that as uh, that I should join the the the, the LDS Church, and um, but it, that that experience, you know, is, I I really believe God spoke to me there and has never never left me. That that moment of just feeling His power and His presence and His His love for me it was it was amazing. And this was outside the Boston Temple. Were you just were you um, meditating, contemplating things, or were you um, walking? I what was, happened? Yeah. So I was. This is after I was a couple couple of weeks of investigating you know, going going to the services and uh in the lds church and i had a friend who was uh doesn't like the lds church very much she, uh, because i think a lot of reasons about one of the big reasons was because she wasn't able to attend a friend's wedding who was married in the temple and, and this this girl's parents weren't able to attend her wedding and she was very you know bitter about that kind of saying how, how terrible and cruel that policy was and after that i just kind of felt a, a, a push or a prompting to, to drive to the the temple grounds and uh, see the temple and that that's when I had that that experience so it was uh you know kind of someone's criticizing the church led me to want to explore more and and led me to have that experience so you uh you said you read a lot of different things you said you were like Mormonism for dummies what other materials were you reading about Mormonism I read I mean I read uh, you know, a little bit after this but after you know, I read as much as I possibly could actually I mean I read a lot of, a lot of the pro and the anti-material that I, everything I could get my hands on really for the first 
I, I was exploring, I, my father really opposed when I kind of began looking at the church, he was really critical and really didn't want me to get involved, get baptized or join the church. And so I waited uh, about 10 months from that experience at the temple to get baptized. And in that time, I kind of looked at everything I possibly could, um, pro and anti. I um, read, um, you know, just that, kind of all the anti-material I can get my hands on at the time. You know, there wasn't the, the CS letter yet, but I got all the material in there. I, I, you know, nothing there was surprising to me when it came out. It was all kind of things I was I'd already studied and spent time on uh, before I joined the church. And what what years was this was this happening? This was in two thousand eight and two thousand nine. Okay, so Rough Stone Rollin would have been out. Did you read that? Yeah, I read that. Uh, I, I spent the, the summer um, after I got baptized, um, before I went on my mission, I, I was uh, in the Mormon Scholars program that Terrell Givens and Richard Bushman run at BYU. So I did that. I was part of that program. So I got to you know, meet Terrell Givens and, and Richard Bushman and, and interact with them. And I'd, I'd, I'd read a rough snow rolling at that point. I don't remember if it was before or after I got baptized. I can't remember the, exactly when I read it. I, but I read that. I read I read Von Brody's No Man Knows My History. I read you know, a, lot, a lot of the kind of classic books of, the, of that you know, genre, book biographies of Joseph Smith. I'd, I tried to, I read a lot. I also read, read a lot about the temple. I, you know, I'd, before I went, I'd, I'd read, I'd read the transcript. I'd read the scene, you know, they didn't have videos yet, but I kind of studied everything I could about, about the church and about the history. And, and I kind of felt I had good answers to the questions or like a basis for faith, at least, or at least nothing that kind of shook the experience, you know, my, my, my faith that was based on the experiences that I had had. Hmm. So, okay. So fascinating to me. So you, you, you have these conversations with this uh, pastor in China, you're you're engaging Christianity. You're also engaging Jesus. You're engaging engaging the Gospels. Did you read the New Testament uh, at at this before this as well? I mean, did, how much study of the New Testament did you do uh, as well? But before, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I yeah. yeah, I mean, when I joined before I joined, I, I read I read the New Testament, but not very deeply. You know, I, I think I I read it once, maybe, maybe once or twice. You know, I read it once at least once through, maybe twice through. I I you know found parts I really liked. When I was a teenager, I read parts of the New Testament as well. I, a friend gifted me a like a study Bible when I was um, sixteen or seventeen, and I'd spent a lot of uh, some time reading. But you know, it was a very superficial level of understanding, and I think you know the. Latter-day Saint concepts are very attractive, I think, when you don't have a very, you know, you kind of, you, you see the Bible, there's a lot of similar terminology, it's a, a lot of overlap, and you kind of think this, this is very similar, it's kind of a, a fulfillment of it, and I didn't have, a, I think, a deep understanding of of the kind of narrative history of the Bible, the kind of ideas, of, you know, how, I mean, what I see now is, as a, 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 a evangelical now, you know, having left the church pretty recently is I see the Bible, the narrative of the Bible, this kind of covenant history leading up to Jesus Christ, and kind of him as the, the fulfillment of all the promises of the Bible, and I don't see the room for the restoration, but when you're kind of not very familiar with the Bible, it sounds beautiful. It sounds like this great fulfillment, and so it really kind of spoke to me at the time, and you know, I see it differently now in many ways. Okay, yeah, so folks, yes, so that's the other thing, is this journey is that, I still want to, I want to talk about your LDS journey. But I, but yeah, I'm sorry also, for uh, ju jumping the gun, I yeah. guess. Spoiler alert, <laughs> uh, but I, I, so, okay, so you, so after 10 months of you having the spiritual experience, you then um, decided to get baptized into your church. How did your yeah. father respond to that? Uh, he was very, very opposed to me getting involved in the church. He threatened to disown me at the time. Um, and then we agreed basically that I would wait a while. At the time we said kind of six months and then eventually extended a little bit longer to be, you know, I wouldn't get baptized. He kind of thought it would just be a phase that I would, you know, quickly leave it and not, not be interested in it. So he, he kind of urged me to wait and, you know, threatened me to, that I, you know, to to wait or said I had to wait or he would stop supporting me and stop speaking to me. And so I waited 10 months and he kind of eventually softened his heart a little bit. At least he, you know, he let me get baptized without, you know, without stop dropping contact, without stopping to support me. So he kind of, he never, never liked the church. He was always very hostile, very critical towards it, but he you know, accepted that it was what I wanted to do. And so he supported the decision to get baptized. It's almost as much as he needed the time more than you needed the time that he needed the time to yeah. process it. And that was, and I, I was grateful for the time. Ulti you know, ultimately looking, it was a hard, hard time in my life in many ways, because it was a lot of um, challenges of, you know, wa wanting to join a church, but kind of feeling like I can't or, or I would lose family support. But I, I'm, I'm grateful for that time in many ways. I think it strengthened me and, and, you know, deepened my, my appreciation for Jesus. Ultimately also, it was a lot of time where I really tried to, dig down deep into what, what I believed and, and my faith in Jesus really grew in that time as well. So I'm, you know, I'm grateful for it in many, many ways, even though it was a really hard, hard period in many ways as well. 
And you would have been in your early twenties. About how old were you when this happened? Yeah, twenty one. Twenty one. Okay, so mm -hmm. you're still still the aftermath of your mom's death. You're still processing. You're here. You're a humanist, but then you wow, so much was going on in your life at this time, man. Jeez, and, uh, yes. and wow, and just did you? So you 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 convert you you get baptized. You still and and your and uh, your father doesn't cut you off, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, what did it feel like to be baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints? It was it was great. It was a one a really wonderful experience getting baptized. You know, it was I really believed so strongly in the the power of it and the cleansing of it. And I really I, I do think that the power of of Jesus as a his atonement was there, and and that he was. You know, I, I really did feel the power of it in my life um, very strongly. And it was, you know, I, I I will say like looking back at it now, I the the, the receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Um, wasn't kind of didn't live up to what I'd kind of imagined it would be like. I, I you know, I, I built up a, a you know, afterwards, I kind of saw some differences in my life. I saw myself being more spiritual and, and feeling God a little more in my life. And I, you know, I interpreted that as the gift of the Holy Ghost. But in some ways, you know, kind of what I, what I expected it to be like was this just really powerful flow of, you know, of, of presence and, and power that I didn't, I, you know, kind of didn't live up to ultimately. But at, at the time I, I thought it was, I thought I had that. I was, I was very happy with it, but I, you know, looking back at it now, I can see that it didn't kind of quite live up to what I, what I imagined beforehand it would be like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and okay. I, you know, now that I, I kind of left the church and I, I've, be, you know, kind of begun really, I, I really feel like I've had that in, uh, in kind of indwelling of the Holy ghost much more like what I imagined it would be like when I first joined the church. And so I've, I've kind of found that more outside the church. Um, oh, okay. Angelical. Christianity, um, when I kind of really accepted Jesus fully, um, kind of really surrendered myself more fully to Jesus, I really felt that spirit in a way that I hadn't before, this kind of power okay. uh, and presence to it. So it's it's been something that actually, like, I was really worried, I, you know, I kind of told for 14, 15 years, you know, outside the church, you can't ever feel the spirit, like it's not there, like the companionship isn't there. And I've that's not what I've felt since at all. That's kind of the opposite of what I've really experienced. You know, this show, I love this show so much because nothing is simple or black and white. It's always very, very complicated. Just the other day, I was Zooming with David Alexander, who's a recent convert uh, evangelical, 47 years in the evangelical church, and church and, and just in the last six weeks, converted to yeah. Church Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And it's so fascinating to hear him just talking to him the other day. And by the way, I will be interviewing him. Uh, we were supposed to get in, in, I was supposed to interview him the other day, but scheduling conflicts happened. But look for my interview with David Alexander to come down soon as well to hear his story. So again, it's very complicated. And it's just interesting to hear your story. But and I want to continue. I want to talk about the, the, the experiences you've had becoming an evangelical Christian. It's really important. But I kind of want you to talk a little bit more about yeah, your story. <laughs> That's okay. No, I think, hey, you're excited to talk about the Holy Spirit. I, I, I say the Holy Spirit can show up at any moment on this show. So you just, you, you <laughs> want to talk about the Holy Spirit, you want to talk about Jesus, we'll do that too. Um, but maybe talk a little bit about um, your, you, your time in the church. Uh, what kind of uh, Mormon would you say you were? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and just talk about that journey as well. Yeah, I, mean, I was I was very committed. I, I served a mission a, a year after I got baptized. I spent, uh, I served in Russia in the Nov Novosibirsk mission. I had a great mission experience. I mean, you know, I really felt the love of God for people that I, I served and, and and met with and taught. And so I, I had a really power, really good mission experience, I think in, in many ways, like, you know, a really, really powerful feeling, feeling of, of God's love for the people that I, I met. And then I, I went to BYU for law school and I had great, great experiences, you know, there and really church was, was great for me consistently. I had, I, I liked, I had good, good experiences in the church. I was part of um, what's called the radical orthodoxy group. That's a you know kind of recent development in LDS circles where it's people that are very faithful and kind of tradition, you know, very focused on, you know, very orthodox in the kind of core values of the church, but also um, promoting uh, toler tolerance and dialogue and uh, different uh, different opinions, uh, kind of the anti Desnat group that I think you know Nate Nathaniel Givens and Jeff Thane and J Max Wilson are the ones who kind of started it. And they, um, you know, were involved with a lot of a lot of really great L LDS uh, people that are, that are part of that group and you know, really promote um, values that I really you know kind of humility and integrity and and uh, charity and civility that I really value. And so I was really involved with them for, for the last couple of years actually, and and. Uh, really liked, loved the the people that I was interacting with. I have the highest of regards for them, you know, and, and uh, you know, continue to, to feel positively towards them in every way. 
So, of course, you before you even joined the church, you knew all about the history of the church. You read a lot of anti stuff. You, I'm assuming you came across the Tanner's materials and all that kind of stuff as well. So, but yeah. none of that phased you. Um, so you're not. So you're because you're you're better informed about the history of the church than a, than a typical member of the church would be. Um, and 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 of course, you had all this information. And then I just want to ask you, like, for instance, at, when you were a practicing Mormon, like the historicity of the Book of Mormon, was that something that was like absolutely 100 percent historical? Yeah, I, I believe it was historical. I, I kind of, you know, l- looked at a lot of the evidence that folks from, you know, FAIR put out about the, the Mesoamerican setting and, and thought it if supported the Book of Mormon. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I had, didn't really think there was good reason to disbelieve it. I kind of thought that the arguments, the contrary, didn't didn't hold up. So I, I did believe in the historicity of it at the time. Now I okay. you know, see it say differently. I think, I think what I've now realized a little more fully is that how how much how many nineteenth century elements are in the Book of Mormon that I didn't fully appreciate at the time. The theology of it, the use of the the New Testament, the use of scriptures, the the way the way it kind of weaves into the Book of Mormon. I mean, really, it's kind of the the thesis of the Book of Mormon is that these people 600 years before Christ believed just like 19th century Christians do. Um, and so if you believe that, I think it's really powerful. And you know, it's, it's like kind of a message of God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. But once you kind of look at it more critically and step back from it, it, it it's hard to believe really that people 600 years before Christ thought the same way, had the same debates about you know, infant baptism or the, the received the Holy Ghost the same way that early Christians did. Um, it kind of you know, comes, when you look at it more critically, it's harder, it gets harder, harder to defend that, I think. And I kind of saw that more and more um, as, as I was leaving the church kind of now. I, so now I see those elements kind of predominant, but at the time it didn't, doesn't bother me as much. Okay. So that's, that's what's so interesting is you have all this information going in. And then you, um, and you, and then, and then yet you're, you know, historicity of the Book of Mormon. You're, you're, you belong to the one true church. You believe this is Christ's church here on earth. Um, what at what point did you start questioning things? Because again, <clears throat> it's not like you came across no. this information at the time. You already had all this information. So tell me how what how did that how did that yeah and it. It's a really, I mean, it's been a been a really the past like really quick kind of process in some ways. Like really, the last six six months have really changed my life in so many ways. Um, my my wife began leaving the church uh, around that that time, um, and she began attending a non denominational church near us, and really that you know really pushed me. I, I kind of originally was really trying to. So she began really embracing doctrines of grace, like really a, a very you know, graceful view of, of Jesus and the atonement. And it was like really changing her life in really powerful, beautiful ways that I really saw um, it, you know, really reduce, eliminating barriers, eliminating feelings of kind of guilt and shame that she'd always kind of felt um, in, in the church setting. And I saw that and I, I thought, well, I, I believe this is part of what the LDS church teaches as well. And I wanted to really show her that they're, the same kind of the, there isn't really that much of a difference ultimately between the two like they're really teaching the same thing about the atonement and about jesus and um i'd always had a very pro grace view of doctrine I, I kind of when i joined the church you know stephen robinson kind of believing christ was the thing that i read that really helped me understand the atonement or brad wilcox's writings about the atonement it was very um you know a very expansive view of it kind of i believed in justification uh like that you know the, the kind of imputed righteousness i'd even believed in uh that we, we kind of take on christ's righteousness um not our own and but and as i studied though trying to kind of show her the similarities um i what i, I kind of realized two things one is really there are big differences uh in the doctrines like more than i kind of i kind of papered over those in some ways and looked into the writings of people like stephen robinson uh, to say, well, really, it's really similar. It's not that different. Um, and, and second, I kind of realized how much the views had changed over time um, uh, on grace and works and then on the nature of God. And I began you know, looking into um, things like, you know, at, kind of Joseph Smith's view on God, the evolution of his views on God, Adam God doctrine from Brigham Young, just like seeing how many core doctrinal truths had changed over time, how they'd come from one point to something very different today. And it really just led me to question, can I really rely on Latter-day Saint you know, prophets and apostles as really speaking for God? Are they really teaching divine truth? Can I trust that what they're saying today really is from God? 
Um, and that's really what kind of under, uh, undermined my ability to trust that. And I realized ultimately, like so much of it depends on one person, you know, Joseph Smith, whether he was really telling the truth, whether he was really speaking for God, especially with some of the things that are more radical departure from Christian kind of orthodoxy, like the the kind of King Follett era, Nauvoo era doctrine, this idea that we can become like God, that God was once not not always God, that there are multiple gods, that God God became God, um, that he has, has a God, a you know, father, kind of these ideas that really depart from orthodoxy. I realize like it all depends on Joseph Smith and, and one person that kind of said this, you know, God's revealed this. And it I kind of weighed on me really heavily to think that that's a, that's a lot to put on one person who was very flawed in many ways, you know, kind of, especially with, with polygamy, right? You know, engaging in polygamy right at this time when he's saying this, you know, God tells me these things that are these departures from orthodoxy. It kind of began to realize I, I can't, rest my my faith and my salvation on on what Joseph Smith taught he's not reliable in many really important ways and and what he taught changed over time and and changed since then uh for modern prophets and that's really what turned me to want to like really study the bible study what god revealed there um and really open my heart to you know different views on on, on grace and on the nature of god and so it was kind of no longer could could trust that what's being taught was um for really from God in a way that was reliable. And, and it really made me want to learn for myself what, what the Bible says you know, as, as, as much as I could to really open myself up to, to what God was revealing to me and speaking to me. And so it was, that, that was really what let kind of catalyzed the process in many ways. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. So, and, and it was because your wife decided to go to an evangelical church. That's what really caused you. And it's interesting because as I recall, and I could mis- correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I provided a link to the Christmas Eve service that I attended here in Florida. And I think you contacted me and said something about watching it or you enjoyed watching it. And this is that you were still identifying as an LDS. At the yeah, time. this is kind of the last like, couple month process of really kind of a lot of back and forth. I mean, I, I had a lot of great experience, spiritual experiences in the church. And so I was kind of wrestling, like, how do I reconcile those with the possibility that I, I was wrong about, you know, the, the church being, being true. And so I was really took a, a couple months to really wrestle and try to figure that out. And uh, kind of being drawn back and forth, like having experiences in the Bible and in this even uh, non demisha church, like really feeling God's power and his presence and really being drawn to it. And then on the other hand, like having these power, these experiences in the LDS church that I kind of was trying to figure out how to reconcile them. It was a real wrestle and took a couple months of really trying to figure figure that out and sort it out and, and figure out you know, how do I fit these things together. And then of course you've got kids uh, as well. And yeah. Uh... They of course spent most of their entire lives going attending your uh, the war. Yeah, they're they're pretty pretty young. Our our oldest got got baptized last year. Okay. Um So they're they're all pretty pretty young, but they they've it's been a good good transition for them in many ways. I think they've really loved love the the church that that we've been going to and really you know, felt kind of a, a difference. I I mean for me what I what I see and I'm excited about for my my daughters um, is I, I love. I feel like in, in the LDS church, there's a lot of pressure that they grew up with feeling. And I've kind of seen that in my wife and others that I've known that are um, good, devout Latter-day Saints that don't feel confident in their standing before God. And they feel this pressure that if they don't live up to the standards, they're failing God and God is not going to support them. And they're going to lose blood, like not, not be, you know, not be able to be with God again. And you know, the, the people that serve missions, uh, serve in the church their whole life, still don't have that assurance that they're going to be in God's presence again. And that's heartbreaking to me, honestly. Like I, I always felt an assurance in the church, but I didn't realize like how many people don't feel that even very faithful people um, who, uh, you know, work for the, serve in the church their whole life with all their hearts. They still don't feel that assurance because there's this kind of impossible standard that they never can live up to and never meet. And so I, I want, I'm excited for my, my daughters not to feel that way. I really don't want them to feel that way. I want them to know that they are saved, know that there, there's an assurance of salvation that comes through faith in Christ. And I, I love that confidence that can come uh, from the Christian belief that you know, you, once you believe in Jesus and you put your heart in him and you you trust him, uh, your, your salvation is assured. You don't have this anxiety of, am I doing enough? Am I living up to some standard that I, I never can meet? You know, this kind of perfect expectation of uh, perfectly following commandments and, and living up, you know, eventually becoming God. I, I love that assurance. And that's what I'm kind of most excited about for myself, ultimately. Like I, 
it's blessed me uh, to feel that that peace and that rest in Christ that you can feel when you you kind of trust Him and know He's His righteousness is what matters, not mine. You know, I, I trust Him and His perfection. Um, but I'm really excited for my daughters to grow up with that and know that and feel that in their life. So you went from radical orthodoxy within Mormonism to be pretty orthodox. You just gave a pretty orthodox statement of faith there uh, yeah. within the Protestant context. So I find that to be very fascinating. And you're very well educated, highly intelligent. And it's interesting because you got all the head knowledge here, but also this is a heart issue too. Yeah. Maybe speak to that a little bit. You know, and I, I didn't, like I mentioned, I, I thought before my views in the church were very kind of grace pro grace. And I, I I thought I had a very expansive view of, of grace as so I didn't expect the change to impact me in my heart as much as it has also really see, I, I didn't expect the, the change, the way that you know, really fully surrendering myself to Jesus, like saying, I, my actions, my works can never get me back to God. Like I'm fully dependent on Christ, on his righteousness. You know, when I stand before God, it's not going to be that I was true and faithful and lived up to expectations. It's going to be that I relied on Christ and his kind of perfection you know, provided the, 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 you know, the, the, for me that I read that righteousness, that, that has been really powerful to me, just like liberating and, and really empowering in, in beautiful ways. And I, I didn't expect it to be as impactful as it has been, to be honest, I didn't, didn't expect it to change me as much as it has. Huh. Uh, so it, it's been really beautiful and, and, the other thing I've really you know, felt is this real desire to worship God um, that I, I, I love, you know, I thought I loved God. I admired him. I had a good relationship with him. I, I believed I, I was in covenant relationship with him. But what I felt so much more in the past months is this overwhelming feeling of awe and gratitude for God. And I think it's coming, comes from seeing him as all powerful kind of creator of everything that exists, you know, uh, everything in the world being created by God uh, out of nothing like that that view of, of the kind of classic the, the you know view of God gives me a, such a desire to to worship him okay to, to fall at his feet and and thank him for everything that he's done and everything he's given me I, I feel that desire much more now as well and so I think it's strengthened and deepened my love and appreciation for God in, in many ways as well I was going to ask you because I was like okay Trinitarianism creation ex nihilo are you just are you're Within this period of six months, you're you're adopting all these Orthodox Christian positions. Yeah, and I, I really, you know, I, I think I had a lot of foundation for them, and you know, I, I'd studied and thought about them before, and kind of, I, 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 I see, I, you know, I, I'd always kind of seen, you know, there's in Mormonism, in Latter Day Saint tradition, different ways of viewing Jesus. Um, some kind of or early. 20th century views saw him very much as like your example, kind of an elder brother, uh, very much not that different from mankind when he was on the earth. And I never liked that. I never embraced that. I'd always had a very high view of Jesus as God, you know, as I, I, I the, you know, in the LDS church, I saw him as Jehovah of the Old Testament, but, you know, really divine from the start of the world, you know, perfect. Um, and so that that kind of view was was really what I what I grew up when I when I joined the church what I came to was very high view of Jesus as 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 God you know not not as a mortal in any way and so it, it didn't take a big big gap to to go to say well really that means he was with God from all eternity he was God from eternity you know he and the Father and the Holy Ghost were from from the creation from the beginning of, of the universe were God together you know existing in in, in love and a relationship so it it kind of logically flowed from what I already believed about the, the the relationship between God. It kind of just pushed it back before creation, you know, before anything existed, before I existed, they already were in relationship with each other. So it, it, it wasn't, I, you know, the Trinity for me wasn't a big jump ultimately to, to really jump, go to it. It really just pushes it back to, you know, what I already believed back before anything existed, back before creation, they were, they existed, they were together in, in this relationship that I always believed they had with each other. So it, it didn't change that much in some way. Yeah. You know, it was a natural out, outpouring of what I already believed about, about their relationship between God and, and Je the father and Jesus Christ. You know, it's fascinating because, you know, people don't realize now, but one of the reasons why many scientists were reluctant to accept the Big Bang Theory, as it was derisively called <laughs> yeah. uh, by Hoyle, um, 
because it sounded way too much like the opening chapter of the book of Genesis in yeah. the beginning, <laughs> God created. And, at, and there was a beginning. And what's so fascinating is that, you know, they a lot of them believe in a steady state theory. They believe in essence that uh, matter was eternal, uh, you know, like like in the Mormon uh, cosmology. So what I find so fascinating is that modern science essentially proved a key core doctrine of Christianity, creation ex nihilo. It's it it it, and that's why the, the these scientists were actually opposed to it, and 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 so and it was a Jesuit that came up with it. So I, I mean, actually, you know, it, it, and so when you think about it, it's like it it it, it, it to me, science proves in essence Genesis one one. And and and, and it, provi- it proves a, a very Judeo Christian idea, you know, of 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 the creation. Yeah, I think that that's that's so powerful to be and then kind of realizing that that the evidence for that and the power of God in in that creation has been something I've really really loved, reali- you know, appreciating more. And I, I think in the Latter Day Saint view, realizing I look back at it, I realize it really appealed to me when I joined the church because of my kind of humanist leadings. Like it was mankind has been there all the time. Uh, we we have the same potential that God does, the same potential that Jesus does, but I don't see that in in what the Bible teaches now. When I look at it, I see Isaiah's teachings about God. You know, I I I'm God from you know, I know God and I know no other. Um, you know, there is no other, not one. Um, no, no other gods formed. I I don't see the, the the teachings there as this idea that we we can ever be become God. You know, He is I think vastly, infinitely more powerful than we are, um, and He. I think lovingly shares his glory with us. He shares, you know, we give the potential, he, he gives us the ability to be in his presence, to enjoy him forever. Um, he creates us out of his love, I think, but I don't think we we can ever become him. We can never become creators ourselves because we are created beings. And there, there's that gap that I think exists that that I didn't recognize before between mm-hmm. God and man, ultimately. Yeah, and, and people like because I tell people I don't believe I I don't believe in belonging to a church, period. So I've never joined a church. Um, <laughs> I, I believe that we're all part of the body of Christ. The, the individual believers are are it's the the church is the people, not an institution per se. This is this is my worldview, of course. And then I was in people's like, well, I don't have you ever con- considered converting to become a church Jesus Christ of And I always say it's the cosmology, it's the nature of God. These are the big sticking points that really fundamentally is a difference between. The, the classical Christian worldview and that of the the, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints and and that's where that's where the difficulties arrive is that when when the if the cosmology is not in line then everything kind of falls into place like if if you, 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 there they are two competing worldviews about just the cosmology and the and, and the nature of God and and those are very there are very very big gaps between our camps in, in that matter. And I, I think for me, one of the moments that kind of was a turning point for me was re, re, rereading John John one one. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And understanding that, you know, what it says there, it's all things were created by this Word, by Jesus Christ, who was with God from from all eternity, you know, from from the from you know, before anything was. You know, kind of that harkening back to Genesis one to the creation, and then reading also in Colossians uh, Colossians chapter one where it says. Um, the sun, you know, it says, you know, the sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things and in him, all things hold together. Um, and he is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. I um, mean, just realizing, reading that, like really opened my eyes to this uh, that that really powerful expansive view of Jesus as from as being God from all eternity you know that he didn't become God at some point um you know when he was on earth or when he was resurrected kind of he, he didn't get glorified then he had that glory and that power that you know equality to God that that is talked about um in Philippians where he you know, didn't feel it um uh, uh, you know he, he he was equal to God in his status and then he voluntarily humbled himself and chose to come down um, as our savior, um, I find that so powerful um, and so beautiful. And, and you know, that he he didn't have to come to earth to have an experience to get a body to be perfected. Like he already was perfect God, um, and, and but chose to come down and and to, to dwell among us and to humble himself. You know, to become a servant. I think as Paul talks about in Philippians, where he um, became a servant and and voluntarily chose to die and you know really humiliating, painful death for all mankind. I, knowing that he did that voluntarily out of his love, out of his loving kindness and mercy for us is just so, it gives me so much gratitude 
for him. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for he, that he did it. He didn't have to come. He didn't have to choose to die for us, but he he chose to come down and to you know be be become a human being uh, in order to die for us. I find that so so powerful and so beautiful. What, and what's so fascinating about it too is really. I tell people, I said, you know, whether you're an atheist or I understand even why you'd be an atheist. I was an atheist for a long time. But I tell people, I said, just think about the story of Jesus. Even Bart Ehrman says there's this itinerant preacher that was going around named Yeshua who was talking about the in, 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 intimate destruction of the temple. So that's a historical fact. That's Bart Ehrman. Okay. This yeah. is a guy. He's a backwoods hick. He's from, it's a backwater of the Roman Empire. He's the backwater, but backwater. Okay. For some, imagine some guy from Appalachia uh, fundamentally changing the course of human history that we actually change our calendars, okay? Think about the almost impossibility of something like this happening. Think of the fact that Paul is interviewing people. Now, Paul was persecuting people because why? Because they were praying to Jesus. So they were worshiping Jesus. These are yeah. monotheistic, yeah. temple-going Jews who are worshiping Jesus. Jesus. That's what ticked off Paul. Yeah. And then Paul, of course, he he then becomes a follower of Christ. He interviews these people and he talks to them. Something remarkable happened. And then the most other remarkable thing was that Christ was talking about the destruction of the temple and it happens. All right. And within the context of Judaism, it's almost as though in one sense, and, and, and I don't want people to take this the wrong way, but think about why isn't it in Judaism that they don't want to rebuild a temple, except for some fringe groups. Essentially, Judaism has dealt with not having to have a temple, even though that was the center of yeah. Judaism up to that point. So it fundamentally changed Judaism in a way that it's 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 almost incomprehensible to see how radical that world, the world Judaism has changed. A new religion starts. The, it, it, it conquers the most powerful empire in the history of the world. And people say, can't they not see something almost had to supernaturally had to happen at the moment. I didn't mean to talk so lot much, but I, I think that's important in talking about. I, I think that no, that's right. I, I see you know, Jesus really coming and fulfilling all the promises that God made in the Bible to the Jewish people. He comes and he is God and he is savior and Messiah. And it, it's really beautiful. I, I, you know, I think you mentioned the worshiping Jesus. And I think you, know, you, you can find references in, in if you look to Paul's writings in First Corinthians and elsewhere where the, the Shema, this this prayer, famous prayer from Deuteronomy, where it's um, hero Israel, Lord is God, a Lord is one, where he puts Jesus into that. He's you using, you invoking this ho holy prayer of Judaism that I, as a child, I recited um, in, in school, in Jewish school, you know, in the morning, and it was the kind of prayer you say in the morning and in the evening every day. Paul, this, you know, you said monotheistic Jew sees Jesus in that and he puts him there and he sees Jesus as part of the divine. And I think you, you, know, you can't read Matthew and Mark and the gospels and all the gospels, you know, Jesus is doing things only God can do. He's forgiving sins. He's controlling the elements. Um, he is, um, you know, in John, obviously he invokes the, I am, you know, the, the, the divine name of God. And so I think Jesus, you know, says, I am God. I am associating myself fully with God in a way that you know, no one else has done. And it's a it's a bold, powerful claim he makes of, of divinity. And so I I see that really strongly now, um, that he is claiming something that you know, only God could do. Um, and that he is saying, I am God. I was God. I am God from all eternity. Um, so I, I I really love being able to, to, to fully embrace that, um, that, that Jesus is divine. He is God. Um, he, God incarnate, he came down and died for me. Um, and I, I think yeah, I've been reading a lot of, I, I love um, Tim Pester, Tim, Tim Keller's writings. Um, I, I read a book uh, he wrote about um, King's Cross, about the gospel of Mark um, that recently that really touched me where he, he talks about, you know, he can, can says can Christianity is in many ways unique in that in, in Christianity, the, the claim is not, here's the things you have to do to please God. It's God came down to offer a way, you know, even though we can't please him, he offered a way for us to be reconciled with him through his own voluntary act of submission and, and death on the cross. And so I, I, I find that so beautiful that it's not just another religion about how to be a good person. It's a, a way to reconcile with God um, that that is an offer of grace and mercy that you know we don't deserve and, and God nevertheless offers it to us. I find that that so beautiful and so empowering. 
So um, before we wrap this up, I, I did want you just to talk a little bit about your time in the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, because this is the thing. You love the people. You love the church. You yeah. you don't have any hatred in your heart at all towards the church. Why don't you just talk about your time in the church and what you're grateful for? Yeah, I, I, there's so much I'm grateful for. I think, um, you know, I, I, I really learned to trust God and to serve, try to serve him with my heart and my mind and my strength in the church you know, going on a mission, I think was, was, a you know, especially my dad was you know really opposed to it. My family, you know, again, got, it was, it was a really hard moment for me, but to, to be willing to go and, and follow God and, and do that um, and then serve him and then give up time and energy and you know, two years of my life to do that. What was a changing, it changed me. And I think I've never been the same after that, that experience. And I think the church, you know, really, taught me to appreciate God's love for everyone, you know, God's love for all mankind um, and desire to, to serve and to, to, you know, to lift up everyone. And I, I think it, it taught me a lot about Jesus. I, I see a lot, a lot of beauty and a lot of power in some of the things that are taught. I just think there are some doctrines that hold people back from the kind of fullest relationship with Jesus that I, I really feel now I, I've been able to develop a deeper connection and a deeper relationship because I think I've stripped away some doctrines that were were stopping me from more fully worshiping, from more fully appreciating God. But I I, I've, I loved the church. I, I think you know, a lot of times you hear stories of people that leave it when they're really negative or bitter towards it, or they've had bad experiences. I, I didn't have bad experiences in the church, even until really sh shortly before I left, I was loving church and worshiping and I, I was serving um and calling and loving my calling I was the Sunday school president for my ward and that was like my dream calling it was so wonderful to be able to you know kind of teach the gospel and and and, and you know support teaching and and kind of bring brother bringing guest speakers in to come do the firesides from uh, uh for the ward and I loved the church I loved serving in it but I'm I'm really grateful for what I've found is a, a deeper relationship with Jesus um, and I found a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit, um, the kind of indwelling presence of the Spirit uh, that I, 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 I've been so grateful for. And so I, I have a lot of love for the church, but I also really you know, see the deeper potential to, to connect with Jesus and to, to kind of strip away some doctrines that are holding people back from that connection and that relationship with Christ ultimately. Well, folks, isn't this interesting? This is going to be a challenge to members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it's going to be a challenge to evangelicals <laughs> it's going to be challenged atheists because there's because you didn't follow the the pattern you're supposed to follow you were supposed to come on mormon stories with john delin and you were supposed to talk about how horrible your 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 experiences were that's the story you're supposed to tell but that's not what happened <laughs> you actually had a positive experience in the church you still th think very fondly of it mm -hmm. and it also helped you develop a relationship with god and show, and, and also appreciate god's love and I just find that to be a very compelling story. And and just, I think that's why I love this channel. Because I think you're the, this is the only channel that you could be on to tell your story. Because you, you don't fit in the box. I don't fit in the box. And I'm just really, and that, I'm grateful to you for coming on and telling your story today, Daniel. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's been really a pleasure to, to talk to you. And I, I really appreciate what you do on your channel. I think it's a... I've been following you since since really early on uh, in your channel, and I'm great excited to see all that you're doing and the growth you've had. I think you're doing a lot of really great work of uniting different uh, different parts of the restoration and different Christians uh, under you know, the umbrella of uh, trying to explore their their views. And I, I really appreciate the work you do immensely. Yeah, and that's the thing is uh, that's what it's all about is get people talk to each other. And I want you to, uh, we will have uncomfortable conversations. Maybe you won't, don't like everything that Daniel said, but you know, you can tell his heart's in the right place. He seems like he's at peace. You're, you're, you have joy in your life and you feel that you have a closer relationship with the savior. And that's the most important thing to me to people. I tell you, I don't care where you go on uh, what building you go to on Sunday morning. Do you have a personal relationship with the savior? I think that's the key thing. And uh, Daniel, uh, you're so awesome. Uh, thank you for taking the time to do this today. And uh, was there any final okay. words you wanted to share with the audience? I, I think, you know, I, I, one thing I will say is that, that you know, I, as a member of the church, I, I, you know, for a long time, kind of thought outside the church, you know, there's no gift of the Holy Ghost, there's no deeper relationship. And and I really just want to you know, encourage people, and really also as people that have left the church, that then become atheists and agnostic. You know, a lot of people do that. 
And I really want to encourage people that are in that in that camp or or that are kind of thinking about their, their faith journey to know that there is a possibility for deep lo- love and deep relationship with Jesus outside the church. Um, and that the, you know, there is the, the kind of the, 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 you know, Jesus Christ is, is bigger in, in than what the church sometimes put, I think puts in a box, uh, the, the relationship with God and Jesus Christ. And I think that the, for those that have left the church and kind of are deconstructing all their faith, I would really encourage them to, to look to Jesus, you know, learn about him, like study the evidence for the rest of the resurrection, study the Bible with open eyes and ask God if there's something he can teach you and, and help you to know Jesus Christ better. Cause he is the savior. He's everything to me. And I, I, my heart really breaks for people that leave and then don't have that relationship anymore. Um, and I, I just really, really wish people would explore more fully what Jesus, you know, the, the gospels teach about Jesus and, and really come to know him as the savior, um, because he, what he offers is, is incredible. And I'm, I'm grateful for him. I'm, I, I, I bear my, you know, I have testimony of Jesus Christ as my savior. Uh, and I want people to have that, uh, even if they leave the church to, to keep that relationship going with him. So I, I would really just encourage those that are listening to, to keep exploring and keep learning more about Jesus. There's more to learn and more to learn, know about him. All right. Well, hey, I want to thank my friends at Terry's Tree Service. Uh, the owner just gave me this T-shirt last night and uh, voted the top tree service in Sarasota County by the Sarasota Herald Tribune readers. And my good friend, Aaron, uh, thanks for the T-shirt. I always want to support my homies. Um, and also just a reminder, for those of you who'd like to support the channel, there are links in the description if you'd like to financially support us on PayPal as well as Patreon. Don't forget mormonbookreviews.com. There's a merch store. We got hot chocolate mugs, hats, T-shirts, you name it as well. But just remember the most important thing is this, folks, all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.